Okay, uh, why don't we get started with introductions today. Uh, so welcome to the January ECSS Symposium. We've got two speakers today, both from TAC, uh, which happens to be closed due to weather today, icing. So Virginia Trueheart was able to join us from her home. Uh, hopefully her dog stays quiet. Uh, and I don't see our second speaker yet. Uh, yeah, Greg, he's just emailing me. He's uh, also coming uh, from home. So uh, appreciate these TAC folks joining today in, uh, in, in some challenging circumstances. So Virginia um, is with the education outreach portion of ECSS, uh, and it's nice to feature a presentation from that group today. Virginia, it will be presenting on the Jetstream system. So those of you who've heard about Jetstream know that it's a, a cloud-based system, so new to typically um, kind of batch queued um, resources that are offered through Exceed. So a, a nice uh, new resource with a novel uh, uh, way of submitting jobs, very interactive, supports virtual machines for customized software environments. So I look forward to hearing more about that from Virginia today. So please take it away, Virginia. Sure thing. Thank you very much. Um, as Nancy said, my name is Virginia Trueheart. I'm a RESA at TAC and I help out with the training that we do and I handle tickets from users. So um, what I'm going to cover today is pretty uh, basic to newer users and also sort of introductory to the Jetstream system. Um, Several of the presentations that have been given before about Jetstream focus on the more advanced options like using the API, but this is definitely geared specifically towards users who are only just beginning to interact with HPC resources and are more comfortable working through something with a GUI. Um, Jetstream is a great starting point for new students or researchers in fields that have lower exposure to HPC, um, and hopefully this will be a good resource for those just starting out. So, uh, quick overview, um, I'm going to cover what Jetstream is and how it's set up, as well as how to access the system. I'm then going to go slightly more in depth about how to select and use images and make the most of your allocation. What is Jetstream? Jetstream is NSF's first production cloud facility. In short, this means you can access high-performance computing via your web browser. It provides on-demand computing resources to users that are in need of interactive sessions. Uh, most traditional HPC computing is done via batch jobs, which requires users to submit their work and then let it run unmonitored. Interactive computing allows users to make real-time changes and more efficiently troubleshoot any issues they encounter. This is particularly valuable to new users who may be learning how to use field-specific software or are just getting used to working on high-performance machines. Additionally, Jetstream provides fully configurable environments. Users have root access and can make any modifications they need. They're not restricted by the administrative choices of a particular computing center. Uh, this system is designed to be user-friendly in order to accommodate users of all experience levels and also make computing and analysis available anywhere. If you have an internet connection, you can run on Jetstream. Finally, Jetstream hosts a large shared repository of images that can be deployed by any user. This makes it easy to get started and also provides templates for users to go on and build more complex images customized to their work. So, a short architectural overview of Jetstream. It's a cloud-based system, but as we know, the cloud is just using other people's computers. In this case, we're using computers from Indiana University, the Texas Advanced Computing Center, and the University of Arizona. The small subset of development nodes that reside of, at University of Arizona um, are pretty much strictly internal. You're never going to use these nodes. But the computational nodes are divided evenly between IU and TAC. These nodes are identical, so it's unlikely to matter which you choose to run on. That said, there are a handful of images that are tied to a specific location. Um, but when you attempt to use those, the dropdowns will self-select the appropriate option when you attempt to launch the instance. So you won't have to um, pay much attention to what you're selecting. 
Oh, sorry. Um, another thing about this flowchart, um, the compute nodes are all connecting to Internet 2 at about 100 gigabytes per second. And the physically distributed system allows Jetstream to be highly available and resilient. Um, if nodes go down in one location, it's unlikely they're going to go down anywhere else. So it's uh, much more reliable for the user base. So now that you know a little bit about Jetstream and you'd like to access it, um, here's the steps for how to do that. You can access Jetstream as long as you have an Exceed account. Uh, you will need to request an allocation for Jetstream, but you should be able to get one almost immediately. Um, even regular users can gain access with a trial access allocation, and um, you all being ECSS staff can request access to either of the ECSS staff allocations I have listed here. Um, and once you have an allocation, you can just go to this URL and log in. Um, you'll need to approve the uh, web app access, but after that, it will log you in and immediately drop you on a dashboard. Your I'm going to take, a, I'm gonna take yeah. a look, Virginia. I think that all the ECSS staff have access to all the, um, the Exceed resources anyway and don't have to do anything special to request or anything like oh, that. Oh, great. Okay. I'll, I'll check and stick something in chat. Yeah, when I did it um, previously, it was still early days, so I think I had to be added in specifically, but by now they've probably streamlined it. Um, so once you do gain access, you can just log in and it will immediately drop you on a dashboard that looks like this. Um, it'll show you how many uh, allocations you have and how much of each allocation you have left and any instances you currently have running. Um, there are also cards at the top um, that provide um, an easy way to launch new instances. Uh, the browse and help resources will take you to the Jetstream wiki uh, as well as uh, the Jetstream forum so you can interact with other users and uh, look into any issues you might be having that way. The final card for changing your settings uh, covers basic stuff like icons, um, but you can also do things like save SSH keys. Uh, if you're accessing Jetstream outside of the web portal. Um, so here on the dashboard, I've gone to the projects tab. Um, this is where you'll be able to see all of the allocations you're part of and anything you might have saved um, for each allocation. What you're looking at here is the detail of the demos allocation um, that I'm a part of. You can see that I have um, a single MATLAB instance running, but I don't have any long-term storage volumes or images saved or links saved for this project. It's just a single instance. Um, but all of this will update depending on the changes that you make to your account. So, now that you have a general idea of what this looks like, we'll show how to start up that MATLAB instance. Um, so the first thing to know is that uh, Jetstream runs uh, by a virtual machine. So you'll need to evaluate uh, what kind of resources your job needs and weigh that against your av available allocation. This chart displays all of the VM sizes that are available and can help you determine which size best meets your needs. It's always a good idea to choose the smallest VM size at which your work can be completed. Uh, first, because it helps preserve your SUs and will help you make uh, the most of your allocation. But second, because it also leaves more resources free for other users. While there's no queue on Jetstream like there is on a traditional computing system, there is still a limited number of resources. And if they're all in use, it is possible um, that it will take a little bit longer for your instance to launch. 
um, that's still usually on the order of minutes rather than hours, like on a regular HPC machine. Um, so the first consideration is how many CPUs you want to run on, but you'll also want to consider uh, the amount of local storage on a VM. Um, this storage uh, can be useful while you're running, but you do need to keep in mind that it's not permanent. Once you kill the VM instance, all of that local storage disappears with the instance. So anything you want to save long-term, you'll need to uh, back up outside of the VM, either um, by a volume or to something on your personal machine. So, uh, in order to launch an instance, you have to choose a base image to use. You can find all of the available images under the Images tab on the dashboard. Um, there's a wide variety of images available, and users can add new public images at any time. Uh, if you know you need a specific piece of software like MATLAB or Anaconda, then you can search for those terms and select an image that meets your needs from all of the tagged images. There's also an immense number of tag options. Uh, some even go as far as to mark um, which department they're for or which kind of science they're doing, bioinformatics, et cetera. Um, so you should be able to drill down to find exactly what you need. You can click on any one of these images and find more details uh, about each of them. The details page of an image will look something like this. Uh, in this case, this is the MATLAB image that I started up uh, previously. So you can see that it is, uh, it holds MATLAB and it's based on CentOS 6 and that it requires an M1 medium image. Um, you can also see at the bottom that there are a few versions uh, of MATLAB available um, and you can pick whichever one uh, um, suits your needs depending on what you're running. So in this case I'm going to use this image and I will click launch to uh, go through the process of starting up the image. When you hit launch, you'll be given a pop-up that looks like this. You'll have to specify uh, which version of the image you want to use, which allocation you want to use, as well as the provider and the instance uh, size. So um, in this case, uh, this is a version of MATLAB that's specifically tied to uh, IU, so the provider drop-down defaults to IU, and it also requires uh, a medium size image, so it automatically defaults there. You can go larger, but it has removed the smaller options from the drop-down since it won't run otherwise. Uh, okay. So it'll take a little bit for your instance to launch, but you can always um, hang out on your projects page and the status will update based on that. But also by default, the system should email you once your image becomes active. Um, so you don't have to sit there and watch it. You can go take care of other things and then just wait for the email notification. Virginia, we have a, a question about the availability of Windows images. I think that's something that's been done, yes? Uh, yeah, there are a couple of Windows based images. I think they're fewer and further between than the uh, Linux images, just because the Linux is open source. Um, so that's what most, um, most of the images are Linux based. And I know the ones that, um, I know all of the ones that TAC and IU have provided sort of as default images are all Linux based. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, one other question. Sure. <laughs> I hope no, you, uh, is Drupal available on Jetstream? Not at this time. Um, I think there's uh, a couple of images that have been set up um, with Docker images and uh, some of the other container options, but I'd have to check with Brian Beck about Drupal specifically. But I think right now we're mostly um, 
just running containers. Uh, it's possible you could build something like that, but like I said, I need to double check that with Brian Beck. Okay, thanks. One final question since I'm interrupting, if you don't mind. No uh, is MDCS available through MATLAB? That's the distributing computing? Yes, um, that is. So both of the, um, depending on which MATLAB image you choose, um, you'll either get a, an IU version or a TAC version um, since we provide the license and all the, um, I know TAC at least, our licenses, licenses apply to uh, almost all of the MATLAB toolboxes. Um, and if there's something you need that's not there, you can always submit a ticket and check with us and we can try and work out how best to acquire that toolbox for you. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, once your image is active, you'll come to a page that looks like this under your uh, projects and you'll have a uh, detail instance details about what's running and how it's running but then on the column in the right hand side you'll have control options for the image and also ways to then interact with those images so for this particular instance i'm going to select the uh, open web desktop from the very bottom option since this will demonstrate the full vm uh, display so when you boot up the web desktop, it's going to generate a new web page for you that's going to look exactly like any desktop um, that you've interacted with before. This particular one has the added bonus of MATLAB already being installed and you don't have to have your own license for it. You can just double click on MATLAB and run as you normally would on your own machine. The other upside is that because you're uh, on Jetstream, you should have far more CPUs available to you than you do on your regular laptop, which means that you should be able to run larger problem sets. Um, so this is a slightly different image that I'm gonna to use to demonstrate uh, how to modify an image. Um, this is a base image that doesn't have anything on it. It's just a, a CentOS 6 developmental image, um, so nothing fancy going on. In this case, I've opened up the web desktop again, but then I've gone ahead under Applications and then System Tools and opened up a terminal emulator. Um, this allows me to make changes to the image, um, and because I have root access, I can make any changes I want. In this case, I'm going to add SAM tools for post-processing some DNA sequences. Because I have root access, I can make use of yum or apt-get if you're um, in, a different, uh, in a different system. But just yum installed SAM tools will um, run the process. And then as you can see here, goes through and it installs SAM tools and you can access it from anywhere within the image. Um, from root, from your account, um, any of the basic search features um, in the desktop, it will be available to run. Uh, since I'm going to be using SAM tools a lot and I don't want to have to reload it every time I start an image, uh, I'm going to want to save this image so that I can pull it up again later. To do that, I have to go back to the projects page. Um, so this is the instance of CentOS 6 that I'm running that I've installed SAM tools on. All I have to do to save it is go to the um, image button that's on the right hand side of the page under actions. Uh, it's a good idea to stop the image first, but you can also do this while the image is active. The only time this won't work is if you've um, completely shut down the image uh, or asked it to reboot. It either needs to be stopped or it needs to be active. So when you click image, it will produce a pop-up. And this pop-up has six steps 
to process and you can see the bulk of the uh, pages it will generate here. Um, sorry. Um, basically when you save an image, you want it to be as, you want your description to be as detailed as possible. So make sure you're naming it something clear um, and that you've described what you've done in the image and that you've tagged it um, with the tags that are useful to you and that could be useful to other users who might also want to borrow this image. Um, so can you choose whether to make an image um, shared or not? Yes. Okay. So that comes, I think, on step four, but um, yeah, you can, you mark the version down and then it will, you can indicate um, whether you want the image to be public or private and um, of course, you know, adjust your tags and how, um, how you want it to be displayed. And then when you get to the end stage, it'll give you the summary, like you can see on the right hand side, that shows all of the options you've made. So there's also a, an access list option. So if there's specific users in your group that you want to share the image with, but you don't want the image to be entirely public, you can do that as well. Um, this image I actually saved as private because it's just a demo and it's not particularly helpful to the larger user community. So once you've filled in uh, all parts of the form, then you uh, just go through and click to save it and that will submit the request to uh, support, sorry, <laughs> submits a request to support. Um, so right now it's not automated and support has to go through and approve each image request, but they are working on making that an automatic process. Uh, the only caveat at the moment is that your image has to remain live. So like I said, either stopped or active, but it still needs to exist. If you submit the save request and then delete your image, um, the image processing queue will get hung up. Uh, there's not a way for it to um, demarcate that the image is gone and just skip it at this time. They're still working out the kinks on that. The usual wait time for um, the image getting approved is between one and two hours, depending on when you submit the image and whether or not support's open. But um, generally speaking, it doesn't take very long. The SU counter is still running while the image is being processed to be saved, but um, they're working on adjusting the SU consumption for, um, for the stopped images so that the charge rate is much lower um, if you're just, if the image is just hanging out waiting to be saved and not really consuming um, a lot of energy. So any image you have saved or attempting to save can be seen under the images tab of your, uh, of your dashboard. Um, in this case, you can see that the status is pending um, and that it wasn't completed. Once the image has been saved, you'll be able to see it specifically under the My Images tag. And once it's under there, you'll be able to load that image the same way you did uh, previous images from the search part of the dashboard. Um, so it's sorted out so you can find the ones that are specific to you. So that's the basic rundown of how to interact with Jetstream. Um, the basic reminders here are that um, the longer your instance runs, the more SUs you can assume. You can run for as long as you need, but just know that if you start up an image and let it run overnight, you're still gonna be charged for all of the hours that uh, the image was up and running. Um, and to go along with that, you just need to be aware that you are on a shared resource. Um, it's not, um, the traffic isn't as heavy as it is on some of the other HPC systems, but uh, it's 
you can still, you know, monopolize some things. And if um, support's going through and checking on things and it turns out there's somebody who's been running for like two weeks, they're probably going to come and check on you um, just to make sure you haven't completely forgotten about an image that was running. Uh, another thing to remember is that while you do have root access, the original image stays intact. So unless you specifically go through and save the image that you've made changes to, uh, that image is going to revert back to its original state when you shut it down. So if you want something to look exactly the same when you come back, make sure you save that image. So yeah, this is just the basic rundown of what you can do with Jetstream and there's infinitely more options available and more complex ways to interact with it, especially using the API. You can help it to run it science gateways or uh, run sort of classroom demos and these sorts of things, but that's, this is just sort of your basic introduction and if you want to know more, then you can go to the Jetstream wiki and dig through that. It's incredibly comprehensive. They've done a really good job documenting everything they can about Jetstream there. So if anybody has other questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions that have come in, um, Virginia, and I, I'll try to paraphrase, but these folks also might want to uh, unmute as well. So we have a number of Science Gateway developers from ECSS who are on the line, uh, mm -hmm. and one of them asks about using a VM to host a gateway with public web access. Do you still need cloud management knowledge? Do you have to set up the networks, volumes, access management, those sorts of things? Um, so yeah, a lot of that, uh, some, well, some of that is going to have to be managed um, by the team setting up the gateway, but uh, a lot of the a lot of what you'll be managing specifically will be the website and then just making sure your connection back to Jetstream um, is working properly, but maintaining, um, maintaining the VM and uh, making sure the outbound connection and all of that will be managed from the Jetstream side. So while you do have to know some, it should be a reduced uh, workload for uh, putting out a science gateway. Yeah, I wonder if it makes sense for us to build some commonly used images that kind of, uh, uh, you know, do some of that background work once and then others can take advantage of it or whether, I don't know, the gateways are just distinct enough that that doesn't make sense. Yeah, and that's, I'd probably talk to Jeremy Fisher about that. He's done a lot of work um, specifically with the API and generating gateways and that sort of thing. So he knows a little bit more about that uh, than I do. But there's, there's probably a market out there for developing something that's just, you know, sort of a basic gateway image that we could then help users to modify. Right, right. Okay. Um, we've got a second question about uh, saving image overhead by installing the modular utility to control the execution environment versus mm -hmm. separate images for different environments. Um, and Carl, if I haven't paraphrased that very well, uh, feel free to unmute. So I think that um, most of the images are tied specifically to whatever um, OS has been loaded. I don't know if there's a way to um, save modules and then just bounce those between each uh, operating system. Yeah, Carl, do you want to swap in and, uh, and unmute? I think what you're saying is is just sort of reusing a standard image and then using modules for more environmental control rather than having lots of different images. Okay, well we'll uh, we'll move on and uh, Aroma also posted a helpful link. Uh, about OpenStack and the command line from the um, Atlassian wiki um, for everybody too. So, okay. Uh, 
why don't we, um, if there are, let's see, one more question and then we'll move on. Actually, if you don't mind stopping sharing, Virginia, okay. and we'll let Greg start. And then meanwhile, we'll, we'll do one final question here. Sure thing. Are the images updated for security patches? Yes. Um, anything that we control. Anything that users have uploaded, we don't necessarily um, track those, but any of the images that are hosted by IU or by TAC um, should be given security patches when something comes out. So I know we were working on um, handling the meltdown patch uh, about a week ago, and I think everything is fixed there. I need to double check with the admins, but we do try to stay on top of that, at least for the images that we have control over. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, for people can feel free to uh, contact both of our speakers on the symposium website and I'll stick the link here in chat there are links to contact information for the speakers their slides will be up uh, within a couple of days and also the video uh, of this as well so all of this can be uh, uh, accessed later on uh, with that I would like to introduce Greg Voss, who, as you can see, is working with PI Amy McGovern at the University of Oklahoma. And this is on simulation of, uh, I believe, the formation of tornado cells. Uh, Greg is one of our visualization experts in ECSS, has a, a Bachelor of Fine Arts and a Master's in um, Computer uh, animation and brings kind of some unique expertise to our ECSS uh, collection of folks. So very much looking forward to hearing uh, Greg's talk and seeing some great visualizations today. So I think everything looks good to go here, Greg. Okay, you don't see the little icons at the right, right? You, you see my, uh, you don't I see do. that. Nope, I don't. Okay, good, just wanna be sure. Well, thanks for that nice introduction. Um, yeah, Corey is the other, uh, the other team member that I spent a lot of time with. Um, he's the, really the, the weather scientist. Amy is the uh, computer scientist and the, uh, her project here is really about machine learning. Uh, so Corey works with her and he's been, uh, he's been very fun to, uh, to work with as he's taught me a lot about about the weather this project actually wrapped up last year but went on for uh it was a, really a couple years or more before that a lot of i've made a lot of material with it so i what i've done here is just select um uh selected some still images to show uh different objects that i found um here's a little uh snapshot of Amy and Corey's research pipeline. I won't read all this stuff out loud, but um, they start out with uh, uh, simulating a hypothetical storm with CM1. And they've been making these on Schooner up at uh, Oklahoma University. They were working with Darter at Nix before that, some of the earlier data sets I worked with. Um, apparently she writes out almost six terabytes. She doesn't give me that much data. She gives me about half that much because she just picks out certain fields that she thinks would be, um, you know, appropriate for what I'm doing. <clears throat> that shows her grid, um, 1200 each way horizontally, and then it's uh, 100 approximately irregularly stacked vertical levels um, representing this domain. It's 120 kilometers square and uh, well over 17,000 meters high. Now, before I forget, um, <clears throat> if you can sort of picture, that's gonna be very differently scaled vertically than it is horizontally. Um, if you think about it, it sort of has to be that way because if this was like nature with those proportions, it would be, you know, like a, like a crepe or something, right? You wouldn't be able to see much in it. So these, um, when you look at the pictures, um, I have not stretched these. This is actually uh, the way her grid is designed so that she can see, um, you know, information inside the storm. 
there's a hundred meter uh, horizontal resolution, and then on an average, uh, the levels average out at 175 meters um, per. And I've got all the standard weather fields that you work with. Um, oh, one second. Sorry about that. The output from these storms is then um, uh, right into these two programs. Amy's is the one on the left, the uh, spatiotemporal relational random forest. And Corey's is the one on the right, the vortex detection and characterization. If you're interested in these, uh, you know, in their, their code, I can, I can send you links to them. The, um, I don't know much about machine learning. In fact, everything I know, I think, is right on this page. But the idea is that they, um, they use these programs to identify patterns in the data and then uh, relate that to whether that particular data set spawns or that particular hypothetical storm spawns a, tor a tornado or not. So they're keeping track of what they're seeing in the data, um, you know, in each data set. Uh, looking for the results, and they they turn these um, features they come up with into these uh, you know their machine learning objects, and these can be fed back into these two programs, uh, and or um, uh, affect Amy's choices on the parameter she sets for the uh, the next storm. The um, the red arrow at the bottom left or bottom right. <laughs> is where the visualization comes in. The idea of this project was to see um, what the sort of visualization I know how to do would uh, bring to their, uh, to their research. Uh, you know, they work with these profiles and slices, um, various techniques. My stuff is very different because it's, uh, you know, it's these three-dimensional sort of spaces. I'll show you some examples, of course. And the idea was to um, just find out what they could learn from that. Could, they, could it help them refine um, their definition of an object? Or perhaps they would see something uh, in the visualizations that they would then want to um, try to find in the data. Or even possibly they could make it um, an object that could be added to the code. Now my job at TAC is to work with the same resources that we make available to and support for the users. Um, so these are, uh, I work on the production systems, same as the users and um, with software such as Pairview and Visit and, and, and Vapor and BMD and various things like that, all those different programs that, that uh, any of our users can take advantage of. Um, there's usually something with the data set that uh, is a little snag reading it, even though it is uh, following a format that uh, Visit or Pairview can read. They might not be able to read that particular data set for one reason or another. And in this case, Amy's uh, irregular um, vertical dimension and also um, the staggered grids, which, you know, the idea is that uh, the scalers I can't remember which is which. I think the scalars are in the, <laughs> I can't remember. The vectors are either on the points or the cell centers and the scalars are on the other. Uh, right now my head's a little muddled, I can't remember which is which. But my uh, colleague, Greg Abram, also in the Viz group, um, originally uh, wrote a plug-in reader for Pairview so that we wouldn't have to essentially duplicate all the data. And the idea was as the data was read in, um, it took care of, of uh, lining up the grids and giving real coordinates to pair view for the vertical dimension. Unfortunately, it really kind of bogged down the rendering process. It, was, it became very problematic, had lots of crashes and stuff. So we finally uh, decided the best thing is to just pre-process the data and uh, convert it all into a VTK format that you know just took care of all these things that Pairview wouldn't like, and um, and then uh, and Pairview reads VTK very nicely, so that solved that issue. Um, so the idea here was to give me this data and have me just look through it, uh, the different fields, and just see what kinds of things I could find in it, and I just made these 
you know, like simple images and um, some animations for just anything that came up. And then Corey would sort of, um, you know, tag those as uh, that's, that's interesting, that's useful, or that's actually weird, or, or maybe that's kind of neat, but we don't really need that or whatever. So, so you know, this relationship uh, gets established um, of sort of the science checkpoint to be sure the directions are, uh, have some sort of value. Um, I put this up, uh, this is the, um, the ever lovely cloud water and ice mixing ratios, which is uh, usually used to show clouds. The point of this is just to show you how two storms, and these perturbations are, are ones that I've got in several of these images, how different they turn out. Um, I had always in the past worked with a lot of data sets um, with the people up at, at CAPS, the Center for Analysis, Prediction of Storms in Oklahoma. And I always thought when they gave me um, a data set with a tornado in it that they, if they wanted a tornado, they just, you know, they somehow made it simulate a tornado. But actually these simulations are just like nature. They can run 50 of these things and none of them actually spawn a tornado. And uh, it's just as predict unpredictable as in nature, apparently. So they made a whole bunch of these and um, a lot of them didn't have tornadoes in them. And they're incredibly different. The, uh, the different storms are all individuals. This is from the same time step in, um, or well, very close anyway, uh, in these two uh, simulations. And the, the one storm, the 37, um, turned into a much, much bigger system. It's much more you know, active, did lots more stuff. So um, David Harrison uh, uh, works with Amy up there. He found me a couple of photographs of real weather I put them in here as kind of just uh, to make this talk different from other ones I gave. I just thought it'd be kind of fun to, to put them side by side with the visualization. We could look and see, um, you know, kind of what may look similar. I did, I did confirm with Corey this morning, this does make sense to do this. This is a, a, a photo of um, weather about 30 minutes before this big tornado hit Elk City, Oklahoma, actually on my birthday last year. You can see um, the central updraft, all the supercells have this, you know, very rapidly um, upward moving air in the center that's kind of the star of the thing. And then um, around the sides, uh, unviewable here because they're um, at a much slower speed are downdrafts um, where air is moving down. And I guess that's, uh, that's thought to contribute to an actual tornado forming. So here's another picture of that weather um, moving along. And so here would be uh, possibly a way to find um, an updraft in the data. The uh, streamlines are showing wind velocity, the, the red is higher magnitude, so you can see clearly that's thrusting up into this updraft, um, the translucent stuff being the uh, cloud water uh, with the ice giving us the, that, that nice anvil head. And those gold surfaces showing areas of uh, higher vorticity kind of where the air is uh, especially sort of actively spinning around itself. I guess vorticity isn't really like something necessarily in, in nature so much as it's something that weather people talk about, you know, like a, an important um, uh, quantity. And those, those squares are representing on the, on the floor, they're, they're 12 kilometers square to give you a sense of the, uh, the scale. The storms, the, they generally go up about halfway in the grid, uh, roughly. So that's, what is that? That's uh, half of 17, so, so, so maybe like nine, maybe like nine, 10,000 um, meters. That sounds about right, anyway. So here's another um, another set of uh, models. These this is uh, vertical velocity. So the the pink surface is um, uh, very fast upward moving air, and the blue is air moving down. Uh, the the two storms are compared here. The same ones as the 37 on the bottom and the 51 on the top. And you can see how the 37 is a much more uh, <laughs> sort of chaotic, more turbulent storm. 
but you know you can see this like this sort of uh effect of the of the updraft um you know pulling the uh the air around in these these big spiral forms and anyway so here's a couple other um a couple other objects uh again comparing those two storms the uh this really pushes my sense of understanding these things. What we're looking at, I'm actually gonna look at notes to be sure I get this right. So the blue is the um, negative gradient threshold. So this is showing, um, this is like representing where the updraft would be. You know, thinking about those photographs, you can sort of imagine this. So that big blue thing is a very, um, that's like the primary uh, mesocyclone. And then the, the skinny two coming down is just where it's kind of um, sort of like a secondary one uh, reaching, pulling up from the ground in that, in that hook echo. I wanted to point that out too. The, the bottom uh, right, you can see in the ground plane um, that, that neat little structure that pulls out in front. The, the hook echo is in the, uh, the radar reflectivity. That's the, 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 uh, the uh, field on the bottom there. Uh, typically that represents a, uh, that typically shows an area of severe weather and it, it shows how the um, updraft is, is like pulling the precipitation around in that form. The red here is um, a higher level of vorticity. And the fact that it's wrapping up into the primary updraft like that, that sort of twisting thing on the lower uh, storm, um, Corey thinks this evolution of the, um, uh, the way the gradient differs in different storms um, could uh, could indicate whether it goes tornado or not. The 37 storm actually did, we think, start a tornado at the very end of the simulation. Um, and then the simulation stopped. But anyway, you can see at the very bottom, there is uh, you know some little uh, squiggly funnel-like things. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, and, and going back to my, my comment at the beginning about how you have to be careful about the, the scale on this thing, that vertically it does not match horizontally. I've seen um, one of my images from this um, caption that that's actually a funnel, that big tube thing coming down in the, um, the lower two images. That would be totally outrageous. That's not a funnel cloud. Um, if there was a funnel cloud, it would be an itty bitty little thing at the very bottom in these scenes. Uh, here's another um, another combination of fields. The tan is helicity, which is the amount of corkscrew in the air. I can imagine that's a little tricky to think of how a surface could represent that, but the surface is from a high level of helicity. So in that area is where the air is corkscrewing very heavily. And um, the key thing is that this is lining up with the um, higher levels of vorticity, the red. Um, and again, this is something that could be considered that could, you know, lead to one of the machine learning objects is, is seeing this happening in this kind of a storm, then they could um, possibly use that to refine something they find in the other code. And you can see that, that uh, hook echo in the front again. Now we're starting to <laughs> diverge from the, uh, you know, the, uh, the science blessed visualizations. I just, I really thought buoyancy was an interesting thing. I hadn't worked with it in any of the storm sets before. This is a slice uh, showing total buoyancy at 50 meters off the ground. Corey's comment basically was, that's interesting. I've never seen buoyancy look like that, you know, shown that way before. And, I, and perhaps over time, uh, it would be considered possibly useful. But I put it on here, we just, I just think it's uh, very interesting information. The higher values uh, obviously would be more buoyant. So we're seeing like, uh, um, 
you know, upper moving, you know, what would represent like upper moving air. And there is some distinct uh, um, borders around this thing so that you can kind of see um, an outline of the mass of the storm that we were you know, seeing from the side before and uh, the indication of the hook echo in the, the bottom center. The contours show the radar reflectivity, so that would be the um, bands of precipitation. So that's a cross section, Greg, 50 meters off the ground? Right. right, it's a slice, so that's parallel to the ground. So we're just looking at a, you know, a slice at 50 meters to show uh, what the air is doing. Isn't that wild? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very visual, yeah, thanks. It's, uh, I did several of them just because I just, I don't know, they just, I just think that's a very interesting way to see it, but I guess, you know, the scientists would have to sort of get used to that to, uh, uh, you know, to really find something about that. If we continue on, if we could do a follow-up project, maybe some of these other um, things like helicity and buoyancy can be um, further explored. So this is from one of the earlier data sets. I think this is one of the ones that probably made on Darter. I was working with um, Amy's grad student, Brittany Dahl, who has since uh, uh, graduated and she's down at the University of Miami now. Um, we were working on this together and I, I put this on here. It's just kind of a, kind of a nice memory. The um, part that she was interested in it was the interaction of the streamlines, the, the wind velocity, which is silver in this one, and the vorticity in gold, and all that turbulent activity at the bottom. Um, I was just, at this point, uh, I was looking for, I had to submit a poster image, and I was just throwing all kinds of um, value, you know, critical values of this thing. And this big ring thing started up at the top. When I, I showed that to Brittany, she um, basically asked me if I could just cut it off so that we could center in on the bottom. And I, I was, you know, I, I asked her if we could, you know, come up with some reason to leave it just because it's such a wild looking thing. And you can see the, you know, the updraft in the wind velocity, like a big tongue pulling out the top of it. So there's this big gap in the email communication between us. Several hours go by, the deadline was at midnight and so I'm like watching the clock. And then she comes back on and says that um, she did some investigation and that thing is called a vortex ring, which is where um, a, a strong updraft actually hits the um, stratosphere and then gets smeared around in that big ring, um, which is, you know, that's kind of a this specialist um, high point when we actually help the scientists learn about something. So she not only, you know, didn't know about that in her data, but, you know, that was like something she could, uh, she could learn about in, in weather. Um, and then for a clearly useless scientific view. This is looking down on it. <laughs> I, I'm pretty certain that a scientist would not be all that interested, but I mean, you gotta admit, looking down the updraft is a novel sort of effect. So we're up in the stratosphere someplace, you know, with a, uh, with a God view. Now, before, uh, I just wanted to wrap this up with um, a, a note that, um, we, you know, pretty much everybody loves looking at the uh, storm uh, simulation, simulations and the, the, the videos. There's all kinds of stuff on YouTube. Uh, Lee Orff has done some absolutely gorgeous stuff. Um, it's fun to look at photographs of the tornadoes. But really, um, I, I think it's important to uh, remember that this, this is actually about human beings. Uh, there's all kinds of stats online about casualties and, and uh, deaths in these, these incredibly powerful storms over the, over the decades. Um, I didn't want to put that, those up. I mean, it's, you know, you can certainly find them, but instead I just thought I would show some pictures of the aftermath so that you can just um, kind of imagine uh, what it would be like for a, a living thing to be in these spaces. And I would think that, I haven't been through my, one myself, but I would, 
I would think that after you, you know, realize your own body was okay and you accounted for your loved ones uh, and friends and so on, it would have to be very difficult to go back to your, your space and just find all the, um, all the stuff, which, you know, comparatively is, is trivial, but still imagine, you know, the tree you planted when the kids were little and it had gotten big and now it's this big, stump torn out of the ground and you know your photographs are all over the place and you've you know lost all the artwork your kids made uh you know my mom's piano is sitting out there in the ditch and whatever that's got to be a pretty horrendous situation and um and uh it's you know really i gotta hand it to um the scientists for committing you know, decades of their careers to figuring out how to uh, increase the lead, lead time on these uh, these warnings and uh, try to figure out some way to handle the, um, you know, the unpredictability of when these things are gonna happen. Um, I build the, the visualizations, the graphics on these projects, but I get a lot of help. Um, like I mentioned, Greg Abram is, um, one of the computer scientists geniuses that helps me out with things that for him are trivial but i kind of suck at programming so to me that's like a big deal to write a reader or something and bowen actually has a background in chemistry um but she helps a lot with uh translating the science just helping me with the write-ups and so on and nina and arna and nick are students that work with me nina uh wrote some uh, calculated some other fields with the data, and Arnab and Nick have helped with the editing. Um, I've got Amy on there and Corey, and uh, that's got Brittany's institutions um, under her name. And then, of course, uh, we've got the acknowledgement for Exceed, and I certainly um, want to mention my appreciation for the program so that I get to work on stuff like this. It's been uh, it's been pretty fascinating. It's been pretty interesting for me. I've, I've learned more than I can keep track of, but uh, um, you know, I uh, extend thanks to everybody for making this stuff happen. If, um, I guess if we have time, you're welcome to ask questions. We're kind of, I kind of used more than I, I meant to. Oh no, that's fine, Greg. Really great talk, really great talk. Just a couple of questions that have come in so far. Uh, how long was the visualization project? How long were you involved with Amy and her team? Um, well, <laughs> I hesitate to say because it's probably kind of a long time. Um, I'm going to say probably two and a half years. Yeah, I imagine some of that was kind of on and off. Right, exactly. I worked uh, multiple projects um, because... Each one, I mean, because they follow the researchers and they suddenly take off for you know China for two months or or get involved in a um, a proposal and sort of have to disappear for a while, or there's some other technical thing that I gotta um, wait for help on. So the projects tend to snag from time to time, and it's always good to have something else to switch to. So um, I tend to always have three or four projects going at once, and uh, they just kind of live as long as uh, they can be, um, you know, justified with the funding and so on. So yeah, I worked with Amy not only before the ECSS thing, but um, uh, we worked on stuff before that. Uh, you know, my job at TAC is is really to sort of show off the visualization resources. So if I can account for that possibility, I can usually talk the management and letting me work on something. Yeah, great, thank you, Greg. It was also a nice description um, from an ECSS perspective about how you go kind of wading into these collaborations where you're presented with a large set of data and then you're trying to make some initial sense out of it. And then there's the back and forth with the science team about what's interesting to them, um, bringing a different perspective, I think, too, when you're you're kind of looking at, at it from an art perspective, and I think that's really interesting how that can influence how the scientists can see things differently as well. Um, I think that we're, we're about out of, out of time now. I haven't seen any other questions um, come in, but I think the machine learning aspects to this are particularly interesting too. 
when you look to, you know, being able to give more advanced notice about these sorts of things, you know, kind of the end goal is uh, kind of anticipating where, where prog problems will develop uh, sooner rather than just as they're about to hit. Yeah, that's the idea. Yep. <laughs> um, so, Greg, this is Sergio. Uh, do you feel threatened by AI at all? Or? <laughs> <laughs> You would have to say that. Um, that I'm, machine learning is going to do what you do, like in 10 years? Uh, I, well, I sort of doubt that. I mean, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the scientists are certainly doing beautiful visualization these days, though. So um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I may get, uh, I may, you know, be uh, retiring at a timely, timely sort of bit where they take over making all these gorgeous visualizations themselves. Yep. Uh, that's a step forward. You'll be able to do something new and even more interesting, I think. There is also a question come in about the algorithm. I think uh, we're you using Paraview for the visualizations. Yeah, on the ones I showed here, except um, maybe, I think the ones at the end might have been um, out of visit, but most of those I made in Paraview. Greg, I have a, this is Amit, I have a question regarding the buoyancy figure you showed. Which uh, figure? I'm sorry? The buoyancy and the contours of radar reflectivity. The buoyancy, I think, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm curious. Uh, the contours are only on the right half of the image and not on the left half. I'm wondering what's going on there. You're talking about the reflectivity? Yeah. Well, just because, um, you know, that's the, the front of the storm. So um, apparently those values, you know, of precipitation, that's just where it was. And the buoyancy, I mean, the buoyancy, I guess, doesn't necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily say there's a storm at that point. It could also be conditions leading into it, so. I see, so these are two different variables and it's kind of hard to put them together. And that's why probably the scientists said that putting well, them that, together in some ways is kind yeah. of interesting. That could be, but if you took away the buoyancy, I mean, I didn't, um, I didn't take out any of the reflectivity. It's just that's, you know, that's just where it was. Right. Cool. Thanks. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. That's uh, reached the end of our time for the symposium. I want to thank both of our speakers for preparing such nice presentations for us today and join us next month at the February symposium where we have a, a couple of speakers from the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, I believe. Thank yep. you very much. Uh, slides Thanks. will be on the web, contact links are on the web, and the video recording. So give us a day or two and uh, everything will be up there on the symposium website. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Thanks, Nancy. Yep. Thanks.